Good morning. How's everyone doing today? Okay, it's good to see all the smiling faces out there. Um, there's a couple things that um, I'm to announce. Um, Anne asked me if I would... Um, there's copies of this. It's a community Iowa Presbyterian gathering, which is August 27th at the First Presbyterian Church in Boone. And there's flyers downstairs by the south door. So if you want, if you're interested or just want to find out more about it, pick up a flyer down there. All righty. Um, well, today during our service, we're going to honor Caroline McNamer. So that will be here in a little bit. Uh, she's done a lot of work for us uh, in the church and especially the Presbyterian women. Uh, next week is going to be the blessing of the children during the service, so you won't want to miss that. Um, there are copies of the upper room um, at the south entrance. If you want one, just you're welcome to take it. We have the recycling beyond the bag. Uh, the box is downstairs by the uh, coat rack. So if you have things like the plastic that comes off of like 24 bottles of water or that type of plastic or off of um, you know other things like say uh, paper towels or something like that, that's a plastic that can be accepted for that. Um, I want you to notice activities um, around town. There's a fiber optics group, music in the park, which will be tomorrow night, and that's at 6, and they're going to have a food truck there as well. And then we have a pancake breakfast by the Masons, and that will be on Saturday morning. And I don't think I have any birthdays here. I'm looking. No. Okay. So let us stand for worship. To each of us and to all of us, the Spirit says, it is time for time as this that we were called to the place we find ourselves. In this time, God calls us to bring assumptions to the surface. In this time, God calls us to speak the truth, even if our voices shake. In this time, God calls us to do what we can for love and justice. It is for such a time as this that we are here now with all of our gifts and all of our experiences and with all of our uncertain hopes. We come to the worship and to be strengthened by the one who equips the call. God of every moment, show us how we can live for the day. Open your word to us that we may find ourselves in your story, in ancient words speaking to our current reality. Make us ready to stand up for what it is right and strengthen our resolves to bear the cost of that choice. Knit us together with all of your people that we may encourage one another in refusing to play along with oppression, embodying instead your kingdom of justice and peace. Amen. There is nothing hidden that will not be revealed. God already sees the truth of our lives inside and out. When we are honest about our motivations, fears, hidden brokenness, and shortcomings, then the Spirit works in us to do a new thing, to bring our faith to bear fruit for God's world. Trusting in the grace, gracious mercy of God, let us confess our faults and failings before God and one another. Let us pray. O oh God, you promise us abundance of life in you, but we confess that we really enjoy the trappings of the good life promised by the powers of this world. When the powers demand, you dehumanize others to maintain our position. We often go along unwilling to rock the boat. When they insist, we uphold unjust laws. We agree simply because it is the law, and we don't know what else to do. When we are asked to sacrifice ourselves to the image the powers want to project, we join in saying one thing and doing another. 
Forgive us, Lord, for choosing our own comfort, security, and desires first. Forgive us and give us your spirit's strength to live without fear, walking in your way. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God is always opening new possibilities before us and invites us to step into new life even if we don't yet see the full picture. For in Christ, the old has gone and the new has come. Believe and live the good news. In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Oh, no, no we don't. <laughs> And we'd like to have Caroline come up, please. And you can come with her, Julie, if you need to or want to. I'm good. <laughs> Okay, just stay in here for a minute. I won't keep you up here long, okay? First of all, that beautiful bouquet is for you, okay? So we can take it downstairs for you. Okay, you're welcome. Um, Caroline is being recognized by the Community United Presbyterian Church, PW, which is also known as Presbyterian Women. In 1960, shortly after the McNamers moved into the Hartford area, she began her venture with CUPC an active PW worker for over 60 years. Now this wasn't just a normal bring a pie to a dinner. This was helping plan, purchasing always at the best price, um, and prepping for the event. She most often managed the kitchen, cooking then, cooking, and then she, as treasurer, she would sit by the door, greeting and collecting the money for the event until the last um, and then she would go back into the kitchen afterwards to wash dishes and scrub the floor and stay until the last person left. And that is the truth. Um, if Caroline said she would do something, you knew it would happen and at the exact time promised. No complaining whatsoever. She always had a smile for everyone and always positive comments about others. She served as PW president several years but eventually settled as PW Secretary and Treasurer for a whopping 38 years. Now that's dedication. If something needed to be recalled, she was just a phone call away and always came up with the answer. We really should have named her Google, or Google should have named Google Caroline. Uh, the great PW rummage sale preceded garage sales, and she played a pivotal part in this endeavor. Also, we must mention the spring handball and chicken and noodle smorgasbord. When several of the PW board gathered to discuss Caroline's celebration, we figured she was instrumental in making more than 10,000 handballs. That's a lot of handballs. The smorgas <coughs> yes, we did. The smorgasbord held, was held for 58 consecutive years. She has served wedding receptions, worked at farm sale luncheons, served numerous church and funeral dinners. She was always there, always dependable. Many years ago, she and others scrubbed the entire tile fellowship hall on hands and knees. Praise the Lord, it was before our addition. Um, back in the days, daily vacation Bible school was held three hours a day for two weeks, and there was no air conditioning at that time. You always found Caroline in the kitchen cooking for our mid- Week Children's Logos program, which in later years was called Camp Life. Caroline has always been a participant of the CP, CUPC Bible study and has been a member of the special choir events during the holidays. 
A few of her other accomplishments, other than church, she served on the Carlisle Care Center Board for 20 years. She served on the Hartford Betterment Committee for 30 years. She was a Girl Scout leader for many years and was active in our school lunch program for 48 years, three as a kitchen manager. So Caroline, we thank you for your exceptional devotion. God bless you. <laughs> And of course, there, is fab there are fabulous treats for after worship today, lots of goodies downstairs. So please be sure to, to stick around and, and, and say hi to Carolyn and everyone else and, and enjoy some, some time after worship today. Our text this morning is from the book of Esther. And I'll be reading the first chapter. This is the, the last of our Forgotten Scrolls series that we're doing this summer. Um, and I'll be preaching on Esther these next couple of weeks um, while we get up to Labor Day. This story happened in the days of Ahasuerus, the same one who ruled over 127 provinces from India to Ethiopia. In those days when King Ahasuerus sat on his royal throne in the citadel of Susa, in the third year of his reign, he gave a banquet for all his officials and his ministers. The army of Persia, Media, and the nobles and governors of the provinces were present. While he displayed the great wealth of his kingdom and the splendor and pomp of his majesty for many days, 180 days in all. When these days were completed, the king gave for all the people present in the citadel of Susa, both great and small, a banquet lasting for seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace. There were white cotton curtains and blue hangings tied with cords of fine linen and purple and silver rings and marble pillars. There were couches of gold and silver on a mosaic pavement of porphyry marble mother of pearl and colored stones. Drinks were served in golden goblets, goblets of different kinds, and the royal wine was lavished accordingly to the bounty of the king. Drinking was by flagons, without restraint, for the king had given orders to all the officials of his palace to do as each one desired. Furthermore, Queen Vashti gave a banquet for the women in the palace of King Ahasuerus. On the seventh day, when the king was quite merry with wine, he commanded Naaman and all of his other eunuchs who attended him to bring Queen Vashti before him, wearing the royal crown in order to show the people and the officials her beauty, for she was fair to behold. But Queen Vashti refused to come at the king's command conveyed by the eunuchs. At this, the king was enraged and his anger burned within him. Then the king consulted the sages who knew the laws, for this was the king's procedure toward all who were versed in law and custom. The seven officials of Persia and Media who had access to the king and sat first in the kingdom. According to the law, what is to be done to Queen Vashti because she has not performed the command of the king conveyed by the eunuchs? The Memucan, in the presence of the king and the officials, not only has Queen Vashti done wrong to the king, but also to all the officials and all the peoples in all the provinces of the king. For this deed of the queen will be made known to all women, causing them to look with contempt on their husbands, since they will say the king commanded the queen to be brought before him, and she did not come. This very day, the noble ladies of Persia and Media who have heard of the queen's behavior will rebel against the king's officials, and there will be no end of contempt and wrath. If it pleases the king, let a royal order go out from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, so that it may not be altered, that Vashti is never again to come before the king, and let the king give her royal position to another who is better than she. So when the decree made by the king is proclaimed throughout all his kingdom, vast as it is, all women will give honor to their husbands, high and low alike. This advice pleased the king and the officials, and the king did as Memucan proposed. He sent letters to all the royal provinces, to every province in its own script, and to every people in its own language, declaring that every man should be master in his own house. 
Let us pray. Dear God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, this is a fun one. So the book of Esther, one of only two books in the whole Bible named after a woman, and this is how it begins. Now this one is very much a story. It's not true, it's not factual. This is a story being told. The characters in this are not real. It doesn't mean it doesn't have lessons to teach us, because of course it does. And there were many, many arguments over the centuries about whether this should even be in the Bible. There have been arguments among the rabbis and among the leaders, and this is another one that Martin Luther wanted to chuck out. He didn't want this one. He didn't want the book of James. There were a few others. But this was high on his list of ones, if it was up to him, it'd be out. Because he didn't see the presence of God in any of it. He thought it was completely pointless. It's a fairy story. It's a fable. It doesn't need to be in there. Now, our Jewish siblings take a very different view of this book. This is one of the five scrolls that gets read during the, the holidays in the synagogues. This is always read for the festival of Purim, which is in, usually in March. And we'll get to why later on, because this book is the reason why they have the festival of Purim. And Purim is a lot of fun. There's lots of revelry. There's lots of, of big parties and lots of food and lots of celebration. It's not a time of, of weeping and mourning. It's a time to celebrate and be filled with joy and have a good time as a family. And so what happens in synagogues is all the children show up for this because in many places this becomes, it's almost a pantomime because it lends itself to that. The, the characters in here are more caricatures than they are three-dimensional characters. And so all the children will be there, and every time the, the bad guy, Haman, gets mentioned, everybody boos, and, and everybody gets upset, and there's, there's all sorts of treats afterwards, and everybody has a, basically a big party that day. And so if we go into the book of Esther with that mindset that this is, it's a story, what can we learn from it? What is the, the author of this trying to teach us? What is this author trying to highlight and point out to us? Then I think we're in the right frame of mind for what happens. Unlike the vast majority of the Old Testament, this is one of the few parts that was not oral tradition first. It was not stories handed down for generations that eventually got written down. This is actually written from the beginning. They can tell that by, by the language use in it, by the time that it was written. It's written, obviously, after the time of the exile, after the time of, of when, when everyone's forced out of Israel into a new land. One of the things that makes this problematic for some people is that there's no mention in this of the people wanting to go back to Israel. There's no mention of any of that in here. Israel's never even mentioned in this. I mean, really not at all. The Jewish people are. But Israel doesn't appear in here. There's no, oh, if only we could go back to the temple and to our ways and to our customs. None of that. Not at all doesn't appear. This is the text that takes the people from exile to what's known as the diaspora, which means to be spread around. But that becomes when people are permanently living other places. They're not going back to Israel, nor do they want to. You can think of it I mean, it's happened in our modern world. Um, a great example is after the Irish potato famine. There was an Irish diaspora, as it's called, 
Folks of Irish descent ended up in Canada, in the United States, in Australia, in New Zealand, in Africa, all over the world because they had to leave. And so they did. That's happened you know, throughout history. That's just a more modern example. I think what's important, though, is to look at the characters, look at how they behave, look at how they interact. Because something that's really important here, I think for us, in a lot of the Old Testament, God is, feels like so much more almost of a physical presence. You know, God's voice is audible and people are walking with God literally and, you know, and those kinds of things. Whereas here, God's off stage. God's not right in front of everyone. And so it's more this understanding that, you know, all we can do is act in the hope that our action corresponds with the plans and purposes of God. Because isn't that where we are? That all we can do is, is act in the ways that you know, we've been taught and that scripture leads us to. But at the end of the day, we can only hope that we're working in the plan God wants us to work in. We're in the same place as the characters in this story. Maybe for the first time in the Old Testament. And that's important to remember. To me, it's, it, it's more relevant, I think, than some other things for that very reason. So let's talk for a minute about this king. This is the king, you know, most powerful king in the world. And this story just, you know, the, the exaggeration and how overblown, 180-day feast. He's brought in all his government officials from his entire empire for six months to do nothing but party. So who's running the government, you know, the territories, if they're all sitting here for six months? You know that people would notice right, around the borders, if suddenly nothing's going on, nothing's happening, nothing's moving for months, to suddenly have no government so that they can party doesn't, doesn't sound too responsible. On top of this, you have a king who, while he has incredible amounts of power and is very willing to show everything he has, all this gold and, and jewels and the descriptions they go into of the gardens with all this marble and all this gemstones and all, and I love the white curtains because we all know white was nearly impossible in the ancient world and blues and purples were really expensive fabrics. So everything is the most expensive and the best and they all have gold cups and they're all you know, individual. They're not the same cup, which takes a lot more time. And, you know, all these details, all these details. They can drink all they want, big flagons of wine. And yet, all it takes is for his wife to say, you know, no. You've been hanging out with the guys now, this last party that goes for seven days now. We've had a second one just for the palace officials. That party has been just the guys. The women are off somewhere else, which was not typical in Persia. The guys are off doing their own thing for seven days, drinking nonstop. And you want me to show up so you can show me off? No. She gives that a hard pass. No, thank you. I'm going to stay here. It's kind of like going in day seven of a stag party. I, I can't see wanting to do that either. That would not be where I would want to go. And she says no. And this completely collapses his entire world. The most powerful king in the world can't handle the fact that his wife said no and has to call in all his advisors and counselors on what to do now. 
which I just think I find quite funny. I mean, this is really funny. That's all she did was say, no, I don't want to come to your party. And this is a national crisis now, an international crisis, that we now have to call in all the advisors and write a new law that cannot be revoked and send it to all 120 some provinces of the kingdom because we're afraid the king will be embarrassed. Well, only a few people knew what happened in the room. You've now spread it to the entire empire. Now everyone will know what has gone on. You've guaranteed his embarrassment in front of the entire empire. And they all think this is a great plan. I don't know how you would enforce this one. How would you enforce this one? This rule that, that every man is the master in his house and that every woman must be subservient. I don't quite know how you enforce that one. What they're showing is issues of power. What is power? You know, how do you ha who has it and, and who receives it and, and, and who loses it? I mean, that's what the story is all about really is power. As we'll see in the coming chapters and the way the story unfolds, it's about power and the dynamics of power and what that does to people in relationships. But isn't it fascinating, you know, one woman pulls the rug out from under her husband's boasting and the kingdom collapses? I mean, really? What kind of power is that really? So Ahasuerus, he's got power in his position and in what he owns and in what he controls, but he doesn't have power within his person. I mean, when you watch him through this, if you, you know, read through all the chapters, it's fun to watch him because he's just bumbling around all the time trying to figure out what to do next. He never knows what to do. This is the most powerful man in the world, and he's clueless as to what to do next. And it kind of amazes me. And the whole scene with Queen Vashti is very similar, if you think about it, to the, the, the New Testament story um, with Herod and, and Salome, where she comes and dances for him in front of all his court, and he's promised her whatever she wants, if she'll, you know, for having done this. So she asks for the one thing that he doesn't want her to ask for, which is the head of John the Baptist. It's a similar situation. He's boasted so much about the beauty of this woman. And she's like, no, you don't get to show me off like you do your things. It's like he can't figure out personal relationship. He has no power as an individual. His power is all in his role and the might that he carries behind him and in his wealth and in his prestige, but not within him. He can't handle what goes on in the world. Power is you know, it's a fascinating thing. It's something we all wield. We all have power at some level, don't we? I mean, we all do. We all have power. We may think we don't, but we do. One of the memes you'll see go across, you know, see posts on Facebook and all these places. And one of my favorites is one, whether it's even true or not, but it's a great idea. Professor who will put on an exam for college students as a bonus question, or as one of the final questions, what's the name of the janitor who takes care of this building? And none of them get it right, because none of them bothered to find out who that person is, even though that person's around all the time. You know, the whole idea that you learn a lot about a person by how they treat those who take care of them. How they treat people who are their 
you know, cab drivers or Uber drivers, wait staff, clerks in a store. How do people treat those people taking care of them? Do they treat them with dignity and with respect or not? I think we can tell what kind of person Ahasuerus is. Power is, it's an incredible thing when you think about it. The amount of it that we have that we don't even realize. You know, and it's fun watching young people grow into adults and begin to understand the power that they now have, that they didn't have before. The power over their own lives, over their own person, that they maybe didn't have absolutely before they were adults. But that's something that we have, and that's what makes it so difficult when we sometimes lose that, and we don't have that power. Those moments when we have to be vulnerable and let that power go become so difficult and complicated for us. Like the moments when we retire and set aside all that power we had in our jobs. Or when we're about to have surgery, you know, and the anesthesiologist tells you those words, you're going to begin to feel sleepy. That can be a frightening moment when you realize you're about to lose all power and control and consciousness and hand it over to people you really don't know that you have to trust know what they're doing. Power over our person is such a vital, critical part of who we are. And you see what happens when you don't have it. That's what this first chapter is showing, is someone who has incredible earthly power, but no real understanding or control of himself and how important that is, and how destructive that can be when a person in earthly power doesn't have that. How destructive is that? I have to admit that's one of the things I enjoy about studying history, is reading about some of these characters in the past, and you just go, wow. How, how did they get by? How did they manage to do all of this, you know, and the damage that happens and the, the, the things that go on just because they, they don't have any control over themselves? This story is going to be filled with issues that, that deal with an excess of, of pride and, and anger and the results that come from that. All these edicts that get, that get written in that can't be revoked, which wasn't really a thing in Persia, but all these edicts that keep getting written and, and then you have to write something else to countermand it and then something else to countermand, that's going to happen all through this story. And it's so incredible that it's happening to a man who, for most of us, has everything. He has everything. He is, you know, the top of the heap. He has the world literally at his feet. But he can't figure out the basics of life all around him. He can't figure out what to do in the simplest of situations. I mean, that makes him... To me, the absurdity of him is so dangerous because it's whoever has his ear in that moment is the one who could get anything done because of the power he has. It's just this unchecked mass of power not pointed in the right direction. One of the commentators I was reading said, we must be cautious about wealth and power without moral discernment. And that to me is, 
the highlight of this book. The caution we have to have about wealth and power without any moral compass, any moral discernment. We see where that gets us. One of the, the movies I remember watching years ago was that movie Wall Street. And Michael Douglas's character is just so horrible. Oh, he's such a horrible man. And so much of that movie, it's just, and, and watching that, and we know there are people like that in our world. We see them. We know they're there. You, know, you watch any of the documentaries on huge companies that have gone under, and, you, watch, and you, you see people exactly like this, that it's just all about you know, grabbing and taking and more, and, and there's no moral discernment at all. It's just all about power and status and wealth, which is exactly who this king is. He might be a great man, but he's not a good one. And this shows the ramifications of that. What does that mean to the Jewish people? What does that mean to any people, to any of us? That a person might be great, but if they're not also good, where do we end up? And so this first story is going to set us up for the next few sermons where the one I'm most excited about is next week. I, I love the passage we're going to have next week. And, and seeing Mordecai and Esther and how this whole story forms and plays out as they try to come to grips with this great, powerful man who very easily at just a word and the point of a finger could destroy them all. So how do you wield power? That's the question we're going to ask the next few weeks. How do you wield power? What does it mean? What does it look like? And so be thinking about that in these weeks ahead. How do we wield power? And how can we do it, not to be great, but to be good? Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this chance to be together this day, to join together in worship, in prayer, and in sacrament, simply to be your people in this place. We give you thanks for, for all the things that you have to show us all the ways that we can follow you to follow in the path that you lead for each and every one of us. We pray for these days ahead. We pray that we begin to understand the path that is unfolding before us, where it leads and where you would have us go. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. I heard coins going in the, the noisy collection, so yay, thank you for that. Um, don't forget the, the plates are there in the back. Um, I will say this, if any of you drove by Wednesday evening, you saw there were cars here till really late. So many thanks to Sharon and to Linda and to Lori. Um, we were able to you know, do the, re the, the review of the books that we need to do periodically just to make sure everything is as it should be. And of course it was. Um, but many thanks for, for all of their help and, and especially to Linda and Lori who are our to you know, financial secretary and treasurer who keep track of all those things um, month in and month out and, and help this place run smoothly. And it's important and it's much appreciated for all your efforts, very much. So let's stand 
Let's sing together the doxology. Please join me in the prayer. Giving God, we can never match your generosity. When we are in need, you are at our side, present to us even in our darkest moments. You rescue us from harm. Make us into a people who celebrate your goodness, drawing others into the celebration of your many blessings. Receive our offerings, even if they are as small as a drink for someone who thirsts. Transform them into the mystery of your reign here and now on earth. In the name of Jesus, your greatest gift. Amen. All right, well, let's look to the Lord in prayer. Dear Lord, our, our creator and redeemer and sustainer, We give you thanks for the the beauty and the majesty of the creation that surrounds us. At this time of year when we see so much of the, the fruit of the land, it reminds us of how fortunate we are. And we see so much, so much goodness all around. We give you thanks for all, of our, for all of our young people. As the younger ones get ready to go back to school, as our college students get ready to head out for that next stage in life. We pray for safe travels for them and for productive studies. College can be a a tough transition for so many. And not just them, but also their families. We pray this day for, for Steve and for Sue, for Karen and for Don, for Jason and for Bart and for Verl. We pray that your Holy Spirit will surround them, giving them strength and and love in the days ahead. We lift up to you, Lord, those names, those people we carry deep within our hearts, known only to you. And on this day, we also give thanks for Carolyn. We give thanks for all the many ways that she has used her gifts and her talents as part of this community. All the ways that she has blessed not just our church, but this town. We give you thanks for all the the love and strength that you've given her over the years that she's been able to share with so many others. We lift all of these prayers to you, Lord, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, 
and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will continue with our time of communion. Please know that all are always welcome at our table to join with us. And as we have been doing for a while now since COVID, we'll, we will come up and we'll hand elements and you can take them back to your seats. So let us begin. We give you thanks, O God, through your beloved servant, Jesus Christ, whom you have sent in these times as Savior and Redeemer and messenger of your will. He is your word, inseparable from you, through whom you made all things and in whom you take delight. You sent him from heaven, where he was conceived and took flesh. Born of the Virgin, by the power of the Holy Spirit, he was revealed as your son. In fulfillment of your will, he stretched out his hands in suffering to release from suffering those who place their trust in you, and so won for you a holy people. He freely accepted the death to which he was handed over in order to destroy death and to shatter the chains of the evil one, to lead the righteous into light, to fix the boundaries of death, and to manifest the resurrection. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we set before you this bread and cup, thankful that you have counted us worthy to stand in your presence and to serve as your people. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of the church. Gather us into one, all who share these holy mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit and confirming their faith in the truth, that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ our Lord. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord took bread, he blessed it, he broke it. And he said, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way he took the cup, and he poured it out, saying, this cup is the new covenant, shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. And now, all is prepared. Donna, if you'd like to come up. All are welcome at this table as always. All who are willing to say Jesus is their Lord are always welcome to join us and to be part of this feast. So please come. You can swing around the outside and come around. And Let us pray. Dear God, we thank you for this chance to share in the sacrament, to be able to share at the table of the people of God. May this meal strengthen us, strengthen our spirits for the work ahead. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I need to quit running back up the stairs. So let's stand and sing our closing hymn, Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. It will be fabulous. So. You go nowhere by accident. Wherever you go, God is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. God has a purpose in your being there. Christ lives in you and has something he wants to do through you wherever you are. Believe this and go in the grace and the love and the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. Go in peace.